This video has been made possible by Ground News. Also, I live stream regularly on Twitch now, like very regularly. Check the link below and follow me as we cover events, game, talk philosophy, and hang out. Check the schedule to see when the next stream is coming. It's actually really fun. Link below. Frail, confused, bitterly partisan, dividing the country and dividing, dividing, dividing. I have less political power because they're importing a brand new electorate. The Democratic Why Party is trying to replace that? the current Anyone electorate. Anyone who supports Donald Trump is a white supremacist and You're must be thinking about destroyed. class, which of course is the real divide in this country. Working class people of all colors. Dividing, dividing, dividing. I'm in shock. Tucker Carlson. Journalist, demagogue, patriot, populist, working man's conservative, white supremacist. Only a tip of the iceberg of what people use when they talk about one of the world's most influential media personalities. A man who seemingly often contradicts himself, yet has a coherent worldview he attempts to put across to his audience of tens of millions. No matter what you think of him, Tucker is one of the most impactful people in the world. So you might as well learn what he actually thinks the same world should look like. Well, plenty of articles and maybe a few videos have been made on different aspects of Tucker's ideology. Today, we will try and combine all of those together with some personal analysis on my behalf as both someone with a formal degree in political science and as well a YouTube politics guy in an attempt to get to the forefront of what actually drives him. Before we start, though, this channel has never shied away from its political bias, something everyone inherently has, but for this hit piece, if you want to call it that, I will keep my personal opinions on who Tucker is for the end. All others will strictly be limited to mainstream accepted coverage of events, but more importantly, Tucker's own words. Now, just like every good story, we have to start at the beginning. Summer after my freshman year, my roommate and I decided to go uh, down to Nicaragua for the summer and work and, you know, get involved in the war, you know, and support the side that we thought was right. Tucker Carlson's background before his tenure as a Fox News anchor is characterized by privilege and deep connections to government and national security. Born into a wealthy family with significant influence, Carlson's upbringing was marked by attending exclusive schools and having access to considerable wealth. His father, Richard Carlson, had influential positions within government agencies involved in propaganda and regime change efforts, notably in Nicaragua. Richard Carlson's involvement in aiding the Contras and promoting regime change aligns with broader US foreign policy objectives during the Cold War era. In Nicaragua, for example, to those uninitiated, the Contras were a drug trafficking far-right paramilitary given free reign by the US State Department as long as they violently cracked down on political freedom in the country, in particular those of all stripes of leftist allowing further U.S. influence to cement itself in a country no longer sovereign enough to be able to choose its own destiny. Tucker Carlson's own activities during his college years, including trips to Nicaragua to support the Contras, suggest a direct involvement in geopolitical affairs from a young age. He also tried to join the CIA out of university, but wasn't accepted. These experiences, coupled with his family's connections to government and national security, raise questions about his true motivations and allegiances, especially in the context of his portrayal of himself as a populist outsider unafraid to challenge powerful entities. Carlson's background suggests a different narrative. His upbringing within the elite circles of society, combined with his family's involvement in government activities, hints at a more nuanced understanding of his role in media and politics. And with that, we jump into the latter part of his life. Where did this kid, raised in a household ridden with foreign policy and American exceptionalism, end up in the end? Tucker, cut it all, Carlson! I'm going to say a word, and each of these fighters are going to respond with the first word that pops out of their minds. You'll like this one. The Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> Authoritarianism. 
After graduating from Trinity College, Tucker Carlson entered print journalism, writing for a variety of right-leaning and mainstream publications. But it's his move into broadcasting that led to his true ascent into stardom. Starting at CNN in 2000, he hosted a show called Crossfire, where he would bring in liberals and debate them on various topics from a more conservative standpoint. A very popular episode at the time was when he debated the Daily Show host, John Stewart. Stop, stop, stop. Stop hurting America. Okay, now. And, and After five years, the show was canceled in 2005, though Carlson stated at the time that it was his decision to move on from CNN, not the other way around. He also ran his show Tucker Carlson Unfiltered on PBS in parallel to Crossfire for a year. Moving on in what would be an unexpected pairing, Carlson hosted the show Tucker on the news network MSNBC until 2008, when it was cancelled for low ratings. The channel itself gradually turned liberal during his tenure, explaining both the ratings and the breakup. It's important to note that throughout his decade at CNN and MSNBC, Tucker held pretty unchanging ideological positions. And while his controversial and straight-up conspiratorial takes weren't brought up as often back then as they are now, there's no evidence to insinuate that he didn't believe in them, but quite to the contrary, was simply limited by the liberal bias of the network he worked on, which limited what he can say out loud. In 2010, he founded The Daily Caller, a conservative Huffington Post in which he served as an editor until 2016 and sold his shares in 2020. Now to Fox News, where likely most of you know him from. Starting in 2009, he rose through the ranks at lightning speeds, slowly taking the best slots year in and year out. From 7 p.m., 9 and 8 p.m., which he held from 2017 after taking the limelight away from Bill O'Reilly. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Fucking thing sucks! Tucker was on top of the world for a while there, but as we know, what rises must come down. And no, I'm not talking about what you're thinking, though there is a thing of mine that you could help raise. My subscriber count. It's two simple clicks for you and a complete game changer for the channel. Go on and sub so that we continue going down these rabbit holes together. Thank you. Now back to the topic. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Fox News Tonight. I am Brian Kilmeade. As you probably have heard, Fox News and Tucker Carlson have agreed to part ways. I wish Tucker the best. I'm great friends with Tucker and always will be. The Fox News love story eventually came to an end on Monday, April 24th. Fox News media CEO Suzanne Scott informed Tucker Carlson that he was being taken off the air without providing a reason. As the highest rated host across all cable news networks, Carlson found his cancellation unfathomable. He declined Scott's offer to include his comment in the press release, opting instead to send a farewell email to staff, expressing confusion and disappointment. So why did this happen? Well, just like everything with Carlson, you'll have to come to your own conclusions, though I won't hide mine. Let's start with the main theories. One theory suggests that Carlson's dismissal was due to accusations of misogyny and workplace misconduct highlighted in a lawsuit by former producer Abby Grossberg. The lawsuit alleged rampant misogyny and anti-Semitism in Carlson's workplace, including derogatory comments and behavior towards women and religious minorities. Another theory points to Carlson's religious rhetoric and criticisms of Fox News' leadership as factors contributing to him being let go. Carlson's comments at the Heritage Foundation's gala, where he blended nationalism conspiracy theories and arguments about conservative Christian persecution, reportedly made Fox News owner Rupert Murdoch very uncomfortable. Yes, that Rupert Murdoch, the king of right-wing media, became uncomfortable by his ideological views. A third theory is Carlson's sharp criticism of Fox News leadership, particularly regarding the Dominion lawsuit and the 2020 election coverage, which may have played a role in his dismissal. Text messages revealing Carlson's disdain for Donald Trump and Fox News' handling of certain issues further complicated his position at the network. 
Next, we have a theory involving Murdoch's children planning to sell the company and believing that Carlson's divisive persona and declining advertiser support made him expendable in efforts to make Fox News more appealing to potential buyers. Finally, Carlson's accusations of Fox News defrauding him and intentionally leaking unaired footage to smear his reputation have fueled legal battles between him and the network, indicating a strained relationship beyond his departure. I have no idea which one of these might have actually pulled the trigger, likely a combination of a few, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to get to know Tucker, and to get to know him, we will. Internally, Carlson's team viewed themselves as loyal to him rather than to Fox as a whole, fostering an environment of animosity towards other shows and networks. This is what is common among all theories on why he left. I have a high tolerance for ridiculousness. It's the seriousness with which ludicrous people are taken that really scares me. We have a big, important country. You can't allow dumb people to act stupidly without you know, reacting to it. It's like, what? Uh, it really freaks me out how mediocre our leadership class is. Not just that they're wrong, but they're like low IQ. It's like Bill Crystal is considered an intellectual, really on the basis of what? Tucker, a guy who to a very big extent carried a large chunk of the network, it seems to me, thought his side of the political spectrum doesn't know what they're doing, thought he could do better and disagreed with both Fox News leadership, the other teams and shows, and even the presidential candidate he so fervently supported. But this is not that story as all this time an employee feels undervalued, so he either leaves or gets into so much trouble with his bosses that they fire him. No, this is from what we can see, a story of a man who thinks he can do better than his bosses, better than his colleagues, better than his president. But better at what? Well, at selling the idea. What idea? Let's find out. And to do so, we'll exclusively look at what the man himself says. No lib analysis, no conservative praise, just Tucker and his belief system. And since we're on the topic of lack of bias, there's a platform out there that can help us dig through the inherent ideological subjectivity of reporting, and it's called Ground News. It's a service that reveals what perspectives different authors and media have when covering the same story, allowing us to have a more holistic understanding of various topics. Tucker, as we established already, is an exceptionally divisive figure himself, something that hasn't been helped much by his recent Putin interview, one that has been taken radically different by one side versus the other. But I was far more interested to see how the Russians themselves saw the interview, and surprise and behold, Western media couldn't agree on that either. So, thanks to good old ground news, I managed to see a better and more complex picture of the whole thing, which in this case is that Tucker received praise for straying away from what the Russian government calls one-sided coverage by American media, but that they were also disappointed by the lack of hard questions. Without ground news, I probably would have only been left with one or the other conclusion and would have missed the more complex reading of the event. You can do that too. If you want to see what sites are reporting on something, their political leaning according to GN and how factual they are, simply type it into the website. So, start seeing the bigger picture today. Go to ground.news to cut through the noise and get a more well-rounded view of complex issues. Get 30% off unlimited access by subscribing through my link this month only. Let's start with the first. Bank of mine has. Um, the way you measure things changes. I increasingly distrust complexity in worldview. So I start with where I want to end up. What's the goal? What kind of society do you want to live in? You want to live in a place where the family is basically unmolested, where the human conscience is totally unmolested, where you acknowledge you can control people's behavior, can tell people you, know, you can't do that. We all have to live together. You can't sleep in a crosswalk. Sorry, it's not allowed. But what you never do is try to control or mandate what people believe. That that is a kind of, you know, that's a sphere that you would never violate. And so in the end, you want to live, if you're in a democracy, any democracy, you want to live in a country where the middle class, normal people, you know, with 100 IQs making 80 grand a year can lead, you know, productive, meaningful lives unbothered by the people in power, and they have the hope, at least, that their kids can do slightly better 
than they have. That was kind of the rule for a lot of the, certainly the post-war period in this country, and it no longer is. So my question always is not like what party wins or, you know, is my economic theory validated or not? It's can we get back to that or can we get as close to that as we possibly can? This is arguably the most direct I've seen Tucker be about what he actually wants to see. A stabilized America returned to its 70s to 90s era of so-called middle class prosperity, a country where everyone has just enough. Now, while admirable as a goal by itself, we must ask why Tucker would want to see his country in this state. Because he just believes in a more stable variation of American capitalism than the one now, since people would be better off? Or is something else at play here? To answer that, look no further than Carlson's own book, Ship of Fools. The very text on the front cover tells pretty much the whole story. How a selfish ruling class is bringing America to the brink of revolution. In his book, and during countless TV appearances, he laments the liberal, but also conservative elites on abandoning the so-called middle class. Working class people of all colors have a lot more in common, infinitely more in common with each other than they do with some overpaid MSNBC anchor. Both political parties and their donors have reached consensus on what benefits them. The people in charge of the country were doing a terrible job. Politicians, big business, the media, they are all on the same side. They all got rich and America moved backward. In his book, Contrary to Most Conservatives, which totally ignored the question of the widening gap between the rich and the poor, Tucker addresses it head on. And he addresses it from an extremely class conscious perspective, just not the one you're thinking of. His critique of wealthy Americans cloistered in a small number of coastal enclaves in and around New York, D.C. and San Francisco, their ability to send their kids to exclusive schools where they only hang with other wealthy kids, this entire bubble they've built around themselves is not problematic for Carlson in his book because of their lifestyle or their enormous wealth, but because they've lost touch with the reality of class division on the ground in the gutters. The elites, unlike in the era of a stable middle class, are not seen as heroes to aspire to, but are vilified, seen more and more often as the class enemy, as all that is wrong with the country, which is happening exactly because they've grown so distant and greedy. Out of sight, out of mind. Carlson then continues to espouse classic conservative theories in his book as he attaches them to the hypocrisy of how the elites themselves live versus what they talk about from immigration, diversity, and so on. But it's the conclusion, just like the cover of the book itself, I guess you can judge the book by the cover sometimes, that actually shows why he is presenting this as such a big problem. Not because the system itself must be changed or because there should be no such thing as ruling elites in general, it would be surprising to hear that from someone who we learn has been raised as an elite his whole life. Must be the elitist in you. <laughs> well, there's a lot of that still. <laughs> no, the conclusion is that Americans have began to see American democracy as a sham because it doesn't work for them. So if we combine what Carlson wants, a stable America with a middle class, and why he wants it to reestablish Americans' belief in the United States as a whole, I believe we come to a very nonpartisan conclusion on what our boy believes. In the need to preserve the status quo, just unlike other conservatives that might call him a populist, he actually knows how dangerous a revolution can be for those he identifies with. The Elite Last year, I read the biography, which I would recommend to everyone in this room, of Peter Rangel, who was the leader of the revolutionary white forces during the Russian Revolution. So Peter Rangel's just been on the front for four years. He comes back into St. Petersburg, totally civilized city, two-hour drive from Helsinki. I mean, it is Europe, okay? Whatever anyone tells you. And he's wandering through, and soldiers are going crazy in the streets. And they're raping women. They're stealing at gunpoint. Soldiers in uniform, in a monarchy, which had not had any behavior like this at all. And he, Peter Rangel just can't even believe it. These are his soldiers. He's a general. And so he's, he's completely freaked out and he goes into a movie theater and everyone in the movie theater is completely absorbed in the movie. Like there's no revolution happening outside. And Peter Rangel thinks these people are insane. So he goes back, he's like, I gotta get to Moscow. So he takes the train to Moscow. I have to tell the czar, this country's falling apart. He's very close to the Romanovs, the family. You should read this. It's, it's just out in English translation in the last three years. It's an unbelievable book, lost to history until recently to English speakers. So he goes back to Moscow and he's close to the Romanovs. And so he goes into the imperial court and he knows all the relatives and there are millions of them hangers on. And he notices about 
80% of the women in the Romanov family are wearing red ribbons in solidarity with the Bolsheviks who wound up, of course we know how it ends, murdering them, murdering them in the basement at dawn. So, wait, what? Peter Rengel says, how is it that this country is being devoured by a violent revolution and the people who can afford movie tickets, that is kind of our middle class, are refusing even to acknowledge that it's happening and the ruling class against whom it is aimed are sympathizing with it. And if this doesn't remind you of BLM, I don't know what does. I'm reading this in my porch. Like, man, I couldn't go to sleep. I was like, wait, I live in that country. That's happening now. I live in that country. That is happening now. Tucker wants to stop a popular revolt. And to do so, he calls on the elites to give some concessions and return to the America of old he speaks of. I mean, I have always tried to be um, much more than right. I've tried to be evidence-based. I don't, especially as I age, I, I believe less in theories or constructs, and I believe more in results. And, and I also believe in honesty. Um, and so if you think that the policy that you're proposing will you know, reach a certain conclusion, produce a certain result, and it doesn't, I think you should acknowledge that. And I think you ought to change your views based on the evidence. To make this concise and follow Tucker's own words on practicality over theory, let's look at his opinions on the biggest domestic and foreign problems of the country. Let's start with domestic, immigration. Well, as a practical matter, it just doesn't work. I mean, countries don't hang together by accident, particularly large, diverse ones that don't have a majority in any category. So there's no, if you don't even have a shared language or history or culture, you know, why would you co you know, why would you remain united as a country? And the answer, which I actually believe in, is that you could hang together around a common idea, a common set of beliefs. You know, here's what we're all for. But our ruling class, and I do think this is the least responsible, the most reckless thing they have done, is they have not only failed to come up with what that set of common beliefs is, they have argued against the fact that it should exist. Okay, so Tucker thinks that common beliefs hold a nation together. And coupled with what we've established his goal to be, the prevention of popular revolt or revolution, we should ask what he blames for this erosion of common American identity. The story of history is the story of invasions. One group of people moving into someone else's land and taking it. One nation ends, another begins. Invasions drive history. Few Americans understand this is happening to them right now. The United States of America is being invaded. For the love of God, this is a damn invasion. Who is allowing this? They invaded our privacy. I think it's an invasion of the country. In other words, it's ending. The country you grew up in no longer exists. Soon it will be unrecognizable. No one is fighting back. Few are even acknowledging it. And the people who lead us are letting it happen. Why are leaders letting this happen? Well, to destroy the country and to change the demographics. Who lives here determines what the country is like. This country is changing faster than you may understand. Americans are being replaced. That's not a conspiracy theory, it's a fact. In August of 2023, illegal immigration outpaced American births, a brand new population. Last year alone, over 3 million people came here illegally just over our southern border. Many take his comments on replacement as dog whistles to Nazi conspiracies of white replacement. And while there is definitely some merit to those conclusions, for the sake of this video, we'll choose not to make those correlations. Tucker himself throws off arguments of being an ethno-nationalist, but does confirm his very real American identity, though. Ethno-nationalism? I don't know. I don't even know what my ethnicity is. I'm like half Swedish, half English, I guess. It's not of great interest to me, I can tell you that. I'm an American. I don't think in ethnic terms. I, I wasn't raised that way at all. Um, and I still don't, and I resist all pressure too. An American identity which is held by common beliefs. Americans are being replaced. That's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. 
So while he says he might not be afraid of some sort of weird genetic replacement of Americans, he very much so considers a mass influx of foreigners and invasion, which de facto, in his opinion, further muddles the idea of what it is to be an American, and as such, hurts the ideas of common identity, which help hold together a nation and help lower chances against revolution. I don't think I need to go through his many other opinions on domestic policy because we'd be here all night. But if you continue applying that same ideological lens we talked about previously, him being against things which he believes lead to revolutionary mentality, you'll find them in almost every single one. Now, let's jump to foreign policy. You know, I've got four draft age children. So if you're playing recklessly fast and loose with their lives, then I have a right to despise you. And I do. So if you're Nikki Haley who's running for president or Ben Shapiro or half the people I see on television casually mentioning the possibility of nuclear war or sending Americans to fight in the Middle East or in any way involving us in a war that has nothing to do with prosperity and peace at home, nothing, in other words, to do with us Americans, then I have a right to call you out and be really offended because it's my family. They live here. It's not a joke to me. It's, there's nothing abstract about it. On the surface, he looks calm and ready. Mom spaghetti. Wait, that's fucking wrong video. Um, okay. So on the surface, Tucker seems to be a sturgeon isolationist. Uh, let everyone handle their own shit. This doesn't concern us. But the latter part of his reasoning here, quote, wars that have nothing to do with prosperity or peace at home implies he's not against war, just wars that don't in any way contribute to the U.S. while talking about Israel in this case. This isolationism, but only as long as it doesn't threaten the real U.S. interests, is not just a one-off. China is a problem that is very hard for the United States to solve. And it's not clear how we do solve that problem. By problem, I mean, you know, sort of giving hegemony over the world to a country that doesn't believe anything really that we believe. It would be a massive change in the way the world operates, in the way that we in the United States live, in the way that you and Great Britain live. I mean, having China in charge of the world would be very different from what we have now. But it's not a question of pivoting east. China has massive influence within our hemisphere. Go to any island in the Caribbean, including the American colonies there. We call them protectorates or sunder colonies. St. Croix, Virgin Islands, for example. All the infrastructure in St. Croix is built by China. What? Why would China be building the airport and the roads in St. Croix? And why are they doing the same in Jamaica and Haiti and virtually every population center in the Caribbean? Also true in South America. Again, this is our hemisphere, which for more than 200 years, we've said explicitly we control, we will not allow, you know, world powers from across the oceans to control, you know, anything of meaning in our hemisphere. And yet they are. And this is being completely ignored. I never heard anybody mention it. Well, also, I mean, if, if you were designing American global strategy, you would think, if you were George Kennan or something, you would think isolating China would be good, therefore splitting Russia off from China would be would good. Be except for the fact that America's rhetoric at the moment seems to be driving Russia to, and China together as, as quickly as possible. What's, and that is, of course, the effect. I, I personally believe it's one of the intended effects but what's so fascinating to me and so repugnant is that clearly there are many people in positions of power in the United States who sincerely believe that we have more in common with China and its government than the government of Russia. People, liberals in particular, tend to completely miss Tucker's attempt to change Americans' perspectives on Russia as some sort of Russian inside job or Tucker obsessing over powerful men he respects. Quite to the contrary and straight out of the horse's mouth, Tucker simply believes that there can be compatibility between Russian and American interest in the context of what he defines as the Chinese threat and mutual Christian identity versus an incompatible East. Specifically a threat on America's position as the world's only superpower and hegemon. Now, you could ascribe this to classic patriotism or maybe a bit of racism, but coupled with what we learned about him in the earlier part of the video, a hit on the American position in the world is a hit on America's stability and therefore a hit 
on the position its elites enjoy within it as well. It's not that Tucker believes America shouldn't wage wars, just that it wages the wrong ones, both physical and economic, and that its imperial focus needs to switch to a quote-unquote truer threat. It's important to understand the moment that you're in, and it cuts against the very core of human nature to understand it, because I am totally convinced at my age that denial is the most powerful of all human instincts. Well, I'm serious. I mean, honestly, I was, was 22 years ago, next month, I was uh, in a plane that crashed, amazingly, in the Middle East, flying from Peshawar, Pakistan, the Khyber Pass was right after 9-11, I was going over to cover the Taliban, and something happened in the cargo hold, and we went down in the sand dune in Dubai. Obviously, I survived, but it was a Pakistan International Airways flight, and the thing that changed my life about that experience was something happened horrible to the plane. Like, there was an explosion in the cargo hold, some debate about what it was, but it happened, and the plane starts dropping, and the wing appears to detach, the right wing, and the plane is like struggling for altitude and going up, gunning the engines and sideways. It's like three in the morning over the Arabian Sea. People are freaking out on the plane. Every person on that plane thought we we're going to die, very much including me. I had three little kids. I was half drunk, which makes it worse. <laughs> and we finally come in kind of sideways into the sand and the plane's on its side. And I'm in the first seat on the plane. It's a big double Airbus. And I just had one thought, which is I'm getting off the plane. And it's you know, totally dark, and you can see burning from the wing, so it's like, it is time to depart the plane. So I hop up, and this male flight attendant stands right in front of me and goes, sit down, everything is fine, everything is fine. <laughs> That's a verb and a quote, everything is fine. It was so demonstrably unfine, I, I can't even begin to describe how unfine it was. <laughs> and... I think just out of pure panic, I like ignored the guy and I opened the door and the slide went up and I jumped into darkness with like four other Westerners in the front. Everyone in the back though, they were like, oh, everything's fine. <laughs> and I thought, I've brooded on that for over 20 years. Like, why did he claim everything was fine? The pilots, by the way, went right out the front windows. Well, they did. Oh, absolutely. Like, whatever. Good luck, guys. Um, and I think he just couldn't metabolize the change. It was so awful, he just could not admit what was happening right there in front of everybody. And this really bothered me all these years, despite the fact it wound up fine for me. Tucker is still on that plane, burning as the flight attendant pretends it's all fine. Just the plane is America, the passengers are its elite, the flight attendant are his conservative colleagues, and he's the only one that can see what's happening. In the same metaphor, even though millions of working people have been engulfed in fire for a very long time, even during his presumed better America of the 70s, his concern for U.S. stability, his concern of the fire, only came when he realized him and his own might end up burning as well. So, Contrary to his idiot colleagues, which either continue to stoke it or refuse to drop some water on it, Tucker believes he knows what needs to be done. His reactionary politics are far more sophisticated to those of his peers. He is a man of astute class consciousness, as we said before, understanding his own position, his own class, and those of his peers as the American creme de la crop and he has dedicated his life to brilliantly, I might add, always respect your opponent, make sure all you sugars and fillings stay in your place below. Fires of revolution, fires of change, fires which in their totality refuse to negotiate any longer with their exploiters can rise and touch the sun. But if a wind blows hard enough, they can end up missing their mark and just engulfing themselves. Tucker is that wind, confusing the working people's direction to a more just world, a world incompatible with so-called elites of exploiters, and directing them at petty differences and empty notions. But it's on you, I guess. Do you want some middle-class scraps those behind Tucker would toss you, or do you want the whole cake?
Thank you for watching. If you made it to the end of the video, that means you'll probably be interested in the live stream segment of what I do here. Check out the links below and join me over on Twitch or watch the highlights over on my Ugopnik live channel. Now it's time to thank all my wonderful patrons without whom none of this would be possible. Especially...